Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. Welcome to the Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. I am TC Ricks. This is the third in a series called After the Coup. This episode being called Organization. In this episode, I will discuss how to resist with others, what not to do, and what to do. Um, And I will follow a similar format to the other podcasts that I have done hitherto now, where I start with uh, recommended reading in case you find me boring or useless. Uh, to give yourself an understanding of what you need to know to organize with others. Uh, so I'm going to start with the most important of these, which is On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century by Timothy Snyder. And the short version of that book is that he goes into great detail about um, resistance movements and the tools that tyrants use to oppress populations and when organizations succeed versus when they fail. Um, the other two I'm going to recommend are The Wire, uh, the HBO TV series, uh, ideally as many seasons as you can, but definitely the first season. And the reason I'm going to do that is because you need a fundamental understanding of how law enforcement actually operates in the real world. And The Wire is, in my opinion, the best way to show you that, um, Shows like Cops or your average police procedural really don't capture it. You need to understand that to most law enforcement officials, this is a job and they've got stats and they've got rules and in any kind, even in a coup, the police are going to more or less kind of work along the same lines. It's just that they'll have even more draconian rules than they have now. But the point is, is that if you're organizing, you need to understand what they deal with. And then the third one I'm going to recommend is called Mindhunter, which is a series on um, HBO so that you get a better understanding of the F- the FBI, uh, how they operate at an institutional level. Uh, it will give you some understanding of the federal government, uh, and that will become apparent. If you really want an actual robust understanding of the FBI itself, you can always check out the book that I wrote for Holistic Design called real-life role-playing D20 FBI, where I did quite a bit of research into that subject, and there's a bibliography in that, which has everything you're ever going to need to know about how the FBI works and how um, not to get their attention if you're organizing against the state, uh, the former United States of America, the whatever you might call it, the Trump states of America, the Republican states of America, whatever. Anyway, Let's get into details. So I'm going to start in a similar fashion to what I did last time, which is to organize this in levels of ease and comfort, which is to say that we're going to start with the things that you can do, organizationally speaking, uh, on the good guy, quote, end quote, side of the line versus um, less so. So... Organizations will vary. Um, I'm going to use an analogy. Actually, before I even start any of this, I want to I want to do a quick lesson so that you understand the situation that you're facing in context. In 2001, almost 20 years ago, technically, actually 19 years ago, around about this time, after the first month at the shock of 9-11, it brought the whole country together. And we were determined to do whatever it took to chase after the people that did this. And in one of the most remarkable military campaigns in the history of mankind, we started going against um, Afghanistan. And the uh, military part of that took a couple more months. But my rage at the Republican Party started around that time. I, I was not a, a fan of them uh, until uh, after the, the Kenneth Starr hearings against Clinton, because I've never liked witch hunts. 
But um, in particular, my tolerance for this kind of crap was just done when they took the goodwill that had been generated by this absolutely tragic event and they basically crammed through a highly partisan, uh, very questionable Patriot Act that, among other things, uh, directed us to go to war with Iraq, which had nothing to do with Afghanistan. And they had been talking about since the election about going after Saddam Hussein. And they used this tragedy as an excuse to go against them. And, you know, people are apologetic for Bush now because he's sane compared to Trump. And Dick Cheney was even worse. But let's basically remember that these people advocated torture. They are war criminals. And, I'm, and, and, and not in the, you know, hyperbole sense. They're actual war criminals who have actually violated the International Treaty of Torture who justified their actions with questionable legal gymnastics with the Office of Legal Counsel, who all of the senior members of the Bush administration are very cautious about international travel because of that. And at the same time in this country, Obama took over in 2008 and did nothing, nothing to any of these people in the interest of causing the country to, to come together. And Biden is his vice president. And you need to understand that the consequences for the Trump administration, if they happen, will almost assuredly happen at the state level. And even if there are federal charges, I honestly, genuinely believe that they will be few and far between. And you need to understand that the message that this sent to the Republicans was that they can get away with it. If there are not consequences for violation of the law, then that law is not enforced. It doesn't exist. So a regime that is in place with these people will have no fear of consequences. Even if there was a revolt, if the same people who allowed us to get to this point are in charge, then in the interest of moving on, there'll be some, you know, truth and reconciliation commission and you know, people will say that was really sad that, you know, a million people got machine gunned because they were gay or black or Latino or liberal. But we need it as a country and centrist to move on, right? If, if that is allowed to happen, then this will happen again, this coup that is on the horizon. And I wanted to put it in context before I moved on to the next point. Gandhi is a remarkable individual, even though his name is starting to be slandered by the highly conservative Modi government, because Gandhi was such a remarkable person that basically his family was able to set up a family business that in some ways was highly corrupt towards the end for like 60 years. And eventually the ineptitude and the corruption and the lies from conservatism got to a point where uh, a, a, a guy that thought it was perfectly okay for a mob of uh, Hindu nationalists to burn and kill Muslims was elected president and still is. Um, but the, the thing you have to understand about Gandhi is as remarkable as he was, he would not have been able to succeed in every colonial situation, right? For India and a declining British empire, guilting them into what they already understood was their moral obligation to get the hell out of India was possible. When monsters blow up churches full of black people in the rural south, slightly racist but somewhat empathetic white people in the north can be persuaded to get up off their asses and vote for people to make America slightly less racist with things like the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s and allow affirmative action to happen in the 1970s. However, nonviolent protest for somebody like, say, Joseph Stalin is insane. 
if Gandhi had been in a Republican government province of the former Soviet Union, say Georgia, and had initiated one of the most successful nonviolent protests in history, his effect on Stalin would have been exactly zero. Nothing would have happened. This is important in a number of reasons. The main thing that it's important to understand when engaged in organized nonviolent protests is to understand, or any form of organized resistance, is to understand strategy versus tactics. From a military standpoint and otherwise, the difference between tactics and strategy is this. Strategy is your long-term macro goal. Tactics is your short-term immediate goal on how to get there. If you have tactics without strategy, you're simply postponing the inevitable. If you have strategy without tactics, you never get your strategic goals because you're inept at ever making any progress to them. So when looking for an organization to back or potentially risk your life in aiding and abetting, because remember, in most circumstances, protest against the regime is now criminal. So going out onto the street and holding up street signs and demanding that Trump steps down after he has a lock on the military is a great way to sign your death warrant and potentially the death warrant of everybody around you. Now, am I saying you shouldn't do that? No, I am not telling you that you should not protest against a totalitarian regime in the United States of America. What I am saying is that you need to understand, A, that you are potentially risking your life, and B, if someone is calling for this nonviolent protest, you need a better understanding of, do they have a sound strategy? If they're appealing to, say, Europe to help administer sanctions against the United States to increase pressure on the regime to hold legitimate elections, that's a sound strategy. Because Europe or Canada or even Mexico have democratic governments and can be persuaded by guilt and passion to change their minds. The Republicans, on the other hand, are the same people that thought it was okay to torture enemies a couple of years ago, and the same people that basically backed the monster that took away our freedom in the first place. You need to understand that to a Republican, any means of power is acceptable. That's why we're even having this conversation. A Republican is going to say that Democrats do the same thing, but if you're not an idiot, you know that that is not the case. And more importantly, you need to understand how we got here, which is centrists saying both sides are the same. If both sides were the same, then I could with absolute credibility be talking about how either a Republican or a Democrat administration is going to remove legitimate elections and make it impossible for you to have a meaningful vote. And that's not the case. That's simply not true. So people that say that voting doesn't matter and people that say that both parties are the same are actually why the Republicans looked at the consequences for their actions and realize that they could get away with anything and they're going to be compared to the Democrats. You need to understand that this is how we got here. And if you continue to listen to the same people or let those people set the rules in a society where you can be killed for doing what is now open and accepted and allowed and legal, then you're spinning your wheels. All around the world, there are oppressed people who have tried nonviolent protest. The Palestinians, the Kurds, the people in Hong Kong, and has gotten them nowhere. Communist China does not care about your nonviolent protest. 
They don't care. They are willing to do anything to stay in power. They are willing to shame themselves to the world and shed blood to stay in charge. A general strike sounds like a good idea, but remember that most Republican leaders are rich. So they can, if they control the ports and they control the means of production and the military, then even if you sit on your ass and don't go into work for 60 days, they're going to be fine. They might lose some wealth in terms of stock market losses, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the other things you need to understand is that without rule of law, um, financial numbers start to mean less and less and less. So their, their wealth is already going to start evaporating, they're, right? They're, they're, at this point, they're in for a penny, in for a pound. And the wealthy are already basically transferring a lot of their assets to places like Europe, where those assets are not at risk. And so my point is not that nonviolent protest is not legitimate and not a good idea, but rather, if you're going to do it, you better do it before the tanks start rolling in the streets, because if you do it after, you're probably not going to accomplish anything. Now, has it accomplished things? Absolutely. The Velvet Revolution, most of Eastern Europe fell, including Russia, initially fell because there were nonviolent protests. So sometimes nonviolent protests work. But, you know, in Russia, they had Gorbachev, and Gorbachev was tired of the bloodshed. He was tired of letting the Soviet Union grind itself to dust because of corruption and ineptitude, and had the courage to initiate change. And by the way, he paid dealer for that. He was removed from power and is widely shamed and almost almost forgotten by history, when he alone helped save half of Europe and almost saved Russia until it got taken over by Putin. So let's talk about middle area, right? So let's talk about something more like the Irish resistance to the British in the Irish Civil War and San Fein. Right, So it was San Fein, you basically had a political party and a revolt. And so it was both a political movement and an actual uh, armed resistance. And there are a lot of organizations around the world. The IRA had them. Uh, Hezbollah had them. Uh, the Basque Party had them. And the problem is that when you have an aligned movement that is that where there's like an invisible wall of separation with armed resistance versus political resistance, the problem is, is that people are not morons. Uh, well, I mean, people who vote for Trump are morons or centrists are morons, but in general, especially the leaders of the world and the leaders of the world in other nations are not morons. And so they understand that if you have a link a to a you know an, a, an organization that is okay committing acts of terror, then um, guess what? Y your political movement is very easy to put on a list of a number of existing laws where you are locked out of every single financial organization in the world. And um, before you think that you can have a revolution without money, let me explain two things very quickly. The first is that the most effective means by which the United States has been able to fight Islamic terrorists in the last 20 years is money and the fact that we control the reserve, the world's reserve currency. Now, that might change very fast if there's a coup in this country, but nevertheless, for now, we are the reserve currency, and we can basically tell the banks in a country that we're going to lock you out of our system if you don't play ball with us. And this has been done a number of times, including Switzerland, which used to have secret banks and now reports everything to the IRS that all of these things are going to be used by the regime on countries that play ball with any kind of a resistance in the United States, right? In other words, let's pretend that after the regime takes power, there's like three organizations 
that each choose a different strategy to resist the regime, right? There's one that does nothing but peaceful protests and gets locked up again and again and again. There's another that's a hybrid movement, kind of like Hezbollah or Seinfeld and the IRA, where um, they do some acts of violence against military targets, but don't target civilians, but they also have a political movement. And then there's one that's just full-on armed revolt against the United States government, right? The, the first, sorry, the last two are both equally going to be locked out of any aid or any financial assistance from anywhere in Europe and Australia and Canada and because they already have long existing policies that once you get put on that list, you're done. Your, your leaders get restricted in their movements. They are not allowed to have access to government power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finally, um, so so I, I guess what I'm kind of saying, and I, I'm going to get to just flat out revolt in just a second, but what I'm trying to help you understand basically is that once Humpty Dumpty falls, putting him back together again is a mess. And that's why I'm having an entire separate podcast episode directed towards actually putting things together in a way that doesn't cause them to fall apart in the first place. That's one of the really valuable things that comes from that book, 20 Lessons on Tyranny, is you need to understand that if your organization doesn't have a meaningful strategy, you're toast. You'll get nowhere. There are many, many people in this world who have been oppressed for centuries, who have a legitimate, recognizable nation state, and still get nowhere. There are places that have liberal democracies with oppressed people that still get nowhere. Scotland and the United Kingdom or Catalonia and Spain are really good examples where you have a, a group of people that legitimately have legitimate grievances with the government and that government never represents their electoral interests and cannot represent their electoral interests, but they have no legitimate legal means of getting free as the rules are written. And the people in the world who believe that it, once it's written and legal, that it's okay to do whatever, are all on board with that. All right. So the reason I had you investigate The Wire and the FBI is that if you're going to go with the organized resistance against the United States, whether violent or nonviolent, but basically doing things that don't involve holding up a street sign that says, please shoot me, um, you need to understand that there are a lot of challenges to that. And the, the most dangerous element is that the FBI is the most sophisticated law enforcement agency in the history of mankind. And one of the things that they excel at is infiltration and destruction. So in other words, you got your little revolution, and let's say that you're smart enough to set it up in a cell structure, which means that basically – you know, any four or five people who are operating only know things and only one person reports to one contact who, who knows several cells, that slows down the, the destruction of an organization rather than having a Rolodex of, say, everyone on the list versus their names and address and with one lucky raid by an FBI task force. Even in a cellular structure, the FBI can and has launched months-long investigation taking down other hostile organizations that did the same thing. Do uh, you remember Al-Qaeda? Now, Al-Qaeda was a theocratic terrorist religious organization that wanted to impose an extreme version of Islam on the rest of the world by force and was willing to do anything to accomplish it. But the same tactics that they used in terms of keeping off federal radar are going to be very similar to the tactics that any effective resistance group is going to use. And the FBI was already good at taking this kind of organization, and thanks to the Patriot Act and al-Qaeda has become ridiculously good at it. Because, right, let me give you an example. You're Joe Smith. Right. You're you're your average American. And, you know, let's say your grandfather gets shot in a protest 
and you decide enough is enough, you're going to join the revol- rebellion, right? You're going to you're going to take it to the Death Star, blah blah blah. Take it to the man. Well, how do you do that, right? You go on Craigslist and say, I you know go to www.revoltagainstheunitedstates.com, right? Unless you know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy, what are you going to do, right? There is no website for the revolution. And and more importantly, the FBI and the NSA and the CIA are going to be setting up all kinds of fake recruitment agencies, traps. And they're really good at it. They're really, really good at it. And they will get even better at it over time because this is a wealthy country. And when you put money behind a problem over time and will, people tend to have a way to accomplish that thing. We never really won the war on drugs because there was a significant chunk of the population that had none of it. They realized how stupid it was and organized and fought it. But you know what? Individual drug lords still got taken down all the time. And even though ultimately marijuana is being legalized and it looks like a number of other drugs may be legalized, it was through rote attrition and was a struggle that basically took decades and that the federal government lost because of stupidity more than anything else. So, you know, if the federal government wants to build walls that push the ocean back 10 miles on every coast in the United States, in theory they could do it, but, you know, the the tide doesn't care and eventually those walls are coming down in the long run. But... Having that as a strategy to defeat the regime is exhausting and demoralizing and would cause more than one organization to rise and fall and be crushed to the dust by the people that did it. Now, I've made it a policy in these podcasts to un- to help you understand that um, there are things you can do. So if you're not going to be involved in the non-violent side of things, and by the way, if you are, one of the things you can do is make sure you're basically anonymous, like really anonymous. Like that means covering your face uh, and not telling anybody where you are and using the burner phones and everything else that I told you in the first podcast about how to lay low. And it also means that um, if you're going to have to tangle with law enforcement, you want it to be local law enforcement and not federal law enforcement, because the instant you get on the federal law enforcement radar, your life becomes very, very difficult. And you may just be better off leaving the country. Oh, and by the way, if you're involved with an organization that is officially considered a terrorist organization by Europe or Canada or Japan or Australia, where the hell are you going to run to? Russia? They're already going to be in cooperation with the United States, too. So what can you do, right? Well, let me put it this way. It is my hope. I, I can't guarantee, I give no guarantees, but it is my hope that if there is an actual revolt, that members of the FBI and members of the military, prominent high-ranking members, who are publicly known and have in the past been publicly confirmed and legitimized by the United States Senate, will head some of these organizations. If that is the case, then those are the organizations you want to join. Because they're going to know where the bodies are buried. They're going to have fifth column agents in the regime working to help them and provide them information that gives them a prayer. Because a grassroots organization... Even a decentralized one that tries to do this stuff is very likely to fail. It's not, it's not guaranteed, but the point is, is that who do you join? Let me put it this way. If this is the kind of thing that you think you're likely to do, you should figure out who's going to be in your little cell now, right? And it probably should be somebody that's already done something illegal because if they, their metal is tested when the regime takes over, they might just turn themselves in. You think I'm kidding, but people are hardwired to obey the law. People are hardwired to sustain their existing comfort and not live in a situation where they're living in a camp month after month. You know, Red Dawn may be 
absolute pablum in terms of wish fulfillment of people that hated Russia. But it gets some things right. In particular, you know, their their living conditions get worse and worse and worse and worse. And what starts out a little comfortable base ends up with them living out of a camp and their numbers continue to get whittled down and down and down and down. And that's what the average resistance fighter, whether it's a successful resistance in the case of the United States revolution against your, uh, England or an unsuccessful resistance like the Republican forces in the Spanish Civil War. Life for a revolutionary is hard. It sucks. And frankly, most Americans can't take it. So I think that the lessons for organizing are, I'll sum up threefold, right? The first one is know who you are joining, make sure you understand what their strategy and who their leadership is, and make sure you're in alignment with that, because otherwise, why are you risking your life for somebody that has no plan? The second thing is you need to understand that, again, you're not just risking yourself, you're risking your loved ones. And if you, if your loved ones are okay with that, then have at it. But telling them, hey, I'm ab about to join the revolution is a great way to have them put in a camp and tortured until they tell you, until they tell the FBI where, the, where you are. And then the third thing is you need to understand that there is no easy path once your freedom is taken. There is there is no easy path forward. There just isn't, right? There, there's no Hollywood ending. There's no magical... Um, there's no magical end, right? Eventually, every regime falls. Non-democratic regimes are, by and large, less stable than democratic ones. But... Even if it falls, there's no guarantee that what replaces it will be democratic. It is very difficult to put the genie back in the bottle once the genie is out. And even if you succeed, you need to have the pieces in place to let you do it. And that's what I'm going to cover in the last podcast. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. Buy my book, Have Name Will Travel, at Amazon and other markets. RedAnvilCreative.com contains all our podcasts. Copyright 2020. To fight... The forces of evil!